Hey, uh, hello. Um, uh, I, let me just say it's a, it's a great pleasure to be at AGU and, and it's very exciting to, to meet a lot of people that I've been corresponding with by email for several years now. Now, I run the website skepticalscience.com and what I do with this website is we take climate misinformation and we refute it with peer-reviewed science. Now, while like, it was a great talk by Susan and, and it would, be, it would be an ideal situation if, if the conversation about climate was focused on solutions and, and the way forward. But the unfortunate reality is we do have to deal with climate misinformation. And, and climate communicators are, are more than aware that there is a, a lot of misinformation that we have to deal with on the internet and, and even in mainstream media and from politicians. So. To, to effectively reduce the influence of misinformation, communicators uh, need to be aware of how people process information and the cognitive processes that are involved when, when you're trying to debunk misinformation. So what I'm going to just uh, explore this afternoon is just some of the, the psychological research about debunking misinformation and just some practical tips on how communicators can do it more effectively. Now, when I started Skeptical Science and started uh, writing, writing these rebuttals of uh, climate myths, uh, the, way, the way I thought about the human brain, uh, I, I essentially I used the information deficit model. And the way this works is, uh, I guess when I, when I went to debunk a myth, I thought of the mind as a well-ordered office with well-organized filing cabinets. And I, I would open up a file, take out the misinformation, and then add all the evidence that that debunked it. And if that wasn't quite effective, then I'll just add more evidence until the job was done. Now, as it turns out, the human mind is more like this. <laughs> when you attempt to correct misinformation, there's a number of psychological booby traps and obstacles that you need to look out for. And throughout the psychological literature, there are actually four separate backfire effects where when you try to debunk a myth, it can actually end up reinforcing the myth in the person's mind. I first learned about these backfire effects when I read a paper by Norbert Schwartz that examined exactly what happens when you attempt to refute misinformation. And what they did in this experiment was they, they, they tested these participants, tested their knowledge about vaccine myths just to work out where their, where their level of knowledge was. And then they showed them this um, flyer that I've got up here, which uh, just debunked all the most common myths about vaccines. Then after about half an hour after they read the flyer, they then tested them again to see whether they could identify the myths from the facts. And the surprising result from this experiment was that some people actually scored worse after reading the flyer and the debunking actually reinforced it in their minds. Now, the driving force behind this familiarity backfire effect is the fact that the more familiar people become with information, the more likely they are to accept that it's true. So when people first read the flyer, they remembered all the details about the debunking and, and if they did the test straight after reading the flyer, they, they scored pretty well. But after a bit of time had elapsed, the details started to fade and all they remembered was the myth. Now, when I first read the paper, I, I vividly remember this feeling of horror when I thought, is skeptical science reinforcing myths in people's minds and I'm actually making things worse? But there is a way to minimize the familiarity backfire effect. And what you want to do is put the emphasis on the facts rather than the myth that you're responding to. So the last thing you want to do when you're uh, refuting a myth is put the myth up in a big headline at the, top of your, at the top of the page, at the top of your debunking. In fact, the, the, recher, the researchers in Norbert Schwartz's paper recommended that if possible, don't even mention the myth at all, but just communicate the facts. Another trap to watch out for is the overkill backfire effect. Now, normally you'd think, and this is, this is how I started thinking when I started um, running Skeptical Science, you would think that the more arguments you give to show that 
a myth is false, the more successful you would be. But it turns out that the opposite can be true. Uh, in one experiment, which was actually in the same, same paper as the, by Norbert Schwartz, they, when participants were offered 12 arguments against a piece of misinformation, it actually ended up reinforcing the myth in readers' minds. Now, why does this happen? Now, processing a lot of arguments or a lot of information takes a lot of effort. So to a reader, a simple myth is more cognitively attractive than an overcomplicated correction. The solution is to, to not overload the reader with too much information. So the, the same experiment found that when they presented just three arguments against the myth, then they successfully reduced the influence of the misinformation. So it turns out that when it comes to refuting misinformation, less is often more. Now, the most powerful backfire effect, and Susan talked about this, and I'm thinking that John will probably touch on this as well, is the worldview backfire effect. And this happens with issues that tie in with people's worldviews and with their sense of identity. If you present evidence that threatens a person's worldview, it can often end up strengthening their belief in false information. Now, this was demonstrated in an experiment where the, the participants were Republicans who believed that Saddam Hussein, Saddam Hussein was linked to the 9-11 terrorist attacks. And through the course of the experiment, they presented evidence to them. Now, uh, they chose this subject because there was overwhelming evidence that there was no link between Iraq and 9-11. Uh, and the evidence also included uh, direct quotes from George Bush. Now, despite the overwhelming evidence, only 2% of the participants consciously changed their minds. And the vast majority of them persisted in, in their false belief. And they used a range of arguments to, to, to brush aside the evidence. And the most common response was attitude bolstering which is bringing supporting facts or supporting arguments to, to mind while ignoring any contrary facts. And this resulted in their strengthening their false belief. Now, there's a number of practical applications that, that I took from, from this research. And the first is that the, it found that the backfire effect was strongest among the participants who were, strong, who were, strongest, who were most firmly fixed in their views. So, you stand a better chance of correcting misinformation among people who are not as, who don't have their mind as firmly made up about these kinds of issues. So the approach we've taken with skeptical science is our target hasn't been to try to convince die-hard skeptics to try to change their mind. Uh, our strategy is to present the evidence so that the undecided majority uh, are not as influenced by the misinformation. Another way that, that information can be made more acceptable is by, and again, Susan talked about this, is by framing the information in a way that's less threatening to their worldview. And I'll give one example, which is a fairly um, semantic, shallow example, but there was research done where um, they found that conservatives were more likely to accept climate action if it was framed as a carbon offset rather than a carbon tax. And what was interesting is the choice of wording had little effect on, on Democrats or, or independents because, because their values are, are not challenged by the word tax. So I'm actually interested in, in what John's going to talk about and hope that uh, you can go a bit deeper than just uh, semantic, semantic framings. So, so that's, a, that's a basic summary of the different backfire effects that, that you um, have to, communicators need to be aware of. Now, let's say you manage to avoid all those different booby traps and, and backfire effects. There's one last psychological pitfall to look out for. Now, imagine the myth that you're debunking is like the, the golden idol in Indiana Jones in, in Raid, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, you can't just remove the idol. You have to replace it with an alternative. Now, this was found in an experiment where... Um, the participants read a fictitious account of a warehouse fire, and the account men mentioned paint 
and, and cans, gas cans, along with explosions. Now, later on in the account, the, they corrected the information and said, no, there weren't, there weren't actually any gas, gas cans or paint in the uh, fire. However, when the participants were asked later on, why was there so much smoke, the people, a lot of the people invoked the oil paint. And what's interesting is, even when they, they acknowledged and they remembered and they accepted the correction, they were still influenced by the misinformation. So they said, yeah, like indicated in one answer that there was no paint or gas cans, but then when they were asked questions about what caused it, they would invoke them. So what's happening here? When people hear misinformation, they build a mental model, a way of understanding what, what causes the, um, the, the phenomenon. And when you debunk a myth, you're removing the myth from their mental model. And that leaves a gap in their understanding. Now, nature abhors a vacuum. So if you don't fill that gap, then people will fill it with whatever explanation is available. In the absence of a better explanation, people often use a wrong explanation. So an important aspect to an effective debunking is to provide an alternative explanation. In the experiment with the warehouse fire, that when an alternative explanation involving lighter fluid and stationary was provided, then people were less likely to cite the paint and the gas cans. Now, a very concise, practical summary of, of all this research that I've just um, described comes from a book. Oh, hang on. I've got my uh, slides in the wrong order. Let's jump. There we go. All right. Now, uh, from the book Made to Stick, which, which I would highly recommend for anyone who's involved in communication. And what this book examines is what makes ideas sticky, what, what makes them, people take notice of them and then remember them over time. And at the end of the book, they address the question, how do you unstick an idea? How do you dislodge misinformation from people's minds? And their recommendation, fight sticky ideas with stickier ideas, which is a very concise summary of, of what I just spent 20 minutes um, summarizing. So I will just jump. Have I got time to give one example? Or? OK, very, just one quick example. I've kind of given away the ending there. but. Now, I'll just give an example of, of, of using this model. Now, here's, here is a, a typical climate myth where they'll say that there's no scientific consensus because 31,000 scientists have signed a petition which is skeptical about human-caused global warming. And what's the core fact in response to this, this, this myth about no scientific consensus? The core fact is that 97 out of 100 climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming. So but if you tell people this, then there's that, you create that gap. Like they'll think, well, why did 20, how can you say 20, 30,000 scientists signed this, this petition when there's a 97% consensus? And to the alternate explanation to fill that gap, you explain that 99.9% .9 of the people who signed that, that, that petition project are not climate scientists. So if you can't quite make him out, oh, no, there's a, he's the little green fella in the uh, bottom right corner is the, the climate scientist among, among that survey. And the, this, uh, this technique of raising fake experts is, is not a new technique either for, for groups that deny science consensus. And we've seen it before in the 70s when um, the tobacco industry also cited large numbers of scientists who denied the consensus. Thanks very much.